Hi, I'm Mark Farner, and welcome to Talking Blues. How has the downtime been for you? The downtime has been a lesson. You can't let anything bum you out because then uh, you'd be away from your natural character. You know, your loving little angelic self inside there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just kind of have to let things be the way they are and not try to uh, influence in any way, but just understand uh, and you know, I've lived long enough life, Mako, to to use this experience to make it a better life. That makes sense. Can we start with the beginning? Tell me how music came into your life. Well, music actually came into my life through my family. My mother, uh, who was from Leechville, Arkansas, moved to Michigan when she was 16 years old. Elizabeth Jane, we, you know, we called her Betty. Most people, even all my friends, most people called her Ma. <laughs> so Ma moved to Michigan when she was 16, met my father, Delton, uh, and they got married and had us kids. But my Ma's side of the family had brought their instruments with them. Everybody came from Arkansas with banjos, fiddles, guitars. My dad uh, played saxophone and he played guitar and sang and all the women sang beautiful harmony it was family you know the voices of family really meld well together and I was under that influence from the time I was able to hear because every Sunday whether it was at my mother's house or my aunt Dorothy's house her sister there was a jam session and everybody brought their instruments and they would play and the women would sing. Everybody would sing, but I re I remember the women because they sang so well and the harmonies were just so perfect on key. And, uh, and I loved it. And we used that occasion uh, to feast as well. So we were going to have Southern fried chicken with, with dumplings, like the hockey puck type, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or sloppy joes. And, uh, and that was it. You know, we always ate good and, uh, and had music on every Sunday without fail. Can I ask you so, what kind of music, what, what would be a song that they would have sang around the table or in the backyard? Uh, old, old standards, uh, you know, southern music, I guess. Uh, some bluegrass, but uh, I don't remember the names of any of the songs. I just remember the harmonies. I, you know, I, I would look up because I was this little tiny guy looking up at these great big humans <laughs> with these big uh instruments, and I was just totally amazed at the sound I was hearing. And, and I think, you know, that gets into a guy because um, after I exhausted my attempts at becoming a football hero, uh, my mother got me a guitar for my 15th birthday. And she, well, she rented it and, and purchased six lessons from the local music store, Marshall's Music in Flint. And the guy who was teaching me on my first lesson told me I had to keep my nails trimmed on my left hand. I mean, that was, I learned that. I learned how to tune the guitar by by ear and, you know, playing the frets, the fifth fret. And uh, that was like, and I played a little ditty with him. You know, that was my first lesson. And by the third lesson, I I took the third lesson and I was playing the ditty and he was playing rhythm. And then I would play rhythm, and he would play the ditty. And he really thought that I was picking up fast. And it's a good thing because right after that third lesson, he shot himself with a 12-gauge shotgun, shot himself in the foot. 
climbing a fence with a shotgun in his hand. So, wow. you know, yeah, it was a that was a number one no no <laughs> in, in gun safety. <laughs> but um, he told my mother, just have Mark go and watch the guys that are in the high school band had to have that rock band and he'll do fine. He's, he's learning by ear and that's the best for him. So that's what I did. My sister was 17 months older than me and I never let her forget. (laughs) (laughs) And, and Diane uh, knew these guys and hung out with these guys that had this band. So I would go over there and they would show me guitar chords and uh, and then they would be playing wedding receptions and what have you, playing out on the weekends, wherever they could, parties. It didn't matter. Wherever they could play, they went and played. So my sister and I joined them, uh, and I would sing because I, I was in the uh, the school choir, and I loved choir. And, uh, and these guys, they didn't want to sing, any of them. So, but they wanted to play their instruments. So I would sing and Rod Lester, he would sing too. Um, but I sang a lot. And when I got good and I got good enough to play, they plugged my ax into the amp. Prior to that, my cord went back and it just kind of wrapped around the handle of the amplifier. <laughs> and the, the light was on, but uh, I was doing the Millie Vanilli back then, you know. <laughs> um, did you have a preference between? Playing guitar and singing? I no, not really. I uh, I loved it when my uncle Woody showed me how to overcome uh, the obstacle of playing one rhythm and singing another rhythm, singing the melody. Of course, it's rhythmic. So I I went to his house and and I said. I'm real because he, he asked me how are you doing. I said I'm doing good. I'm learning, and uh, he let me play his J45 Gibson acoustic that he had, and I showed him a few things that I had learned. He says, "Wow, that's that's good." And, and I said, "But my problem is when I try to sing and play that, I can't play that. I got to stop playing in order to sing it." He says, "Oh, come in here. I'm gonna cure you that shit right now." <laughs> so. <laughs> we go in his dining room. He sets me across the table. He puts the Flint journal down on the, the table. And it's I'm reading it like upside down. I'm seeing, and he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go through this paper and read all the large print. And it's upside down and backwards. He says, I want you to understand that, though. I want you to read it out loud, say it out loud. And become fluent at that. Turn the page, do the next page, turn the page, do the next page. So I did that for, God, I did it for about an hour straight. And he's in there watching television (laughs) and I'm watching the the Flint Journal. I mean, I've gone through it enough times. So I had it about memorized. And uh, and he came in and he says, well, come on in here and get that guitar now. Let's see if, uh, let's see if it worked. So I picked up the guitar and I started playing Nadine, Chuck Berry's Nadine. As I got on the city bus and found a vacant seat, I thought I saw my future bridal walking up the street. You know, and I'm playing it, dude. And it's it's coming out. And I'm doing it. And I looked up him. He's got a great big smile on his face. And I'm going, oh, my <laughs> God, I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> and And that. That was the day I overcame the obstacle of, you know, that that was in my head, obviously. Uh, But, uh, and I passed that along and it's helped a lot of people because I'll go to a show and somebody, you know, that has heard me talk about that will say, man, that I thought you were just bullshitting and (laughs) and I did it. And, you know, it really worked, man. So, uh, yeah, if, if anybody's having a, a hard time with that, give that a try. Because what it does, in order to do that, you have to use your right and left. You have to cross the hemispheres of your brain to, to put that together. And and that's what you do as a musician to overcome the obstacle of playing one pattern with your two hands and singing another pattern with your vocal. 
Wow. At what point did you think that you wanted to become a musician? Well, after I had hurt myself playing football and my mother got me the guitar lessons, I, I started putting my whole life into that guitar. And uh, it wasn't maybe a year, not even a year. And my mother bought a Harmony guitar and amplifier, a matching amplifier, out of Finger Hut catalog, which was like a green stamp catalog or something, you know, back then. Yeah. And, uh, and man, it was an electric guitar. And I just, I couldn't put the thing down. I took it to bed. I woke up in the morning. I'm playing the guitar. I played it all day. I mean, I played it. I played it. I played it because it was uh, it was helping me. It was it was making me grow, and I needed it. So, uh, yeah. Until uh, Grand Funk started, I've been you know sleeping with my guitar all them years. I, it was just like a natural thing. I wake up and I want to play. But but Grand Funk didn't start that much later, right? And we're talking four or five years, something like that. Like you guys yes, started that's right. like very quickly things started happening for you. Yes, and, and we were twenty years old. Don and I were twenty and Mel was nineteen when the band started. Did you have and any we, idea what, what you wanted out of that band? No. I just wanted uh, to get up on stage and entertain people and I wanted to hear them clap their hands and shout my name brother <laughs> if i'm not mistaken you you that's part of what you loved about being a football player too oh yes yeah i like the accolades i'm i'm kind of drawn to them like a <laughs> magnet <laughs> so very quickly i don't know how much how much gigging you guys did before the atlanta pop festival in 1969 how how how, how much had grand funk played before that big festival we played one show before that big festival what was that show like was it a bar gig or a theater it gig? was no it was a fair it was uh uh i think it was hamburg county fair it was in it was outside of buffalo new york oh and we we got on stage in a great big ass tent and and played and uh, people loved it and we thought wow man these these people ate that stuff up and at the time Mako, we were playing the songs that i wrote for the first album let me ask you about that how did songwriting come to you we we know where the voice comes from we know where your guitar comes from but how did songwriting happen for you well i had these jams you know chord progressions that i would put together and uh don and i when we first started talking about putting a three-piece band together we uh he, you know i'd play him some of the stuff and he says you got any words to that i said i got ideas for words so when we would get together to rehearse with mal shocker at the flint federation of musicians they would say, well, we're going to go grab some food from McDonald's. Why don't you go ahead and write that song? I said, okay. <laughs> so I would write it, you know, and it just would come to me. And that's how most of the first albums, I mean, you know, it just came like that. And it started coming. And I found it easy to write once I overcame that obstacle of not being able to play and sing the two different parts it's like writing is part of that same mechanism and it just fit in there and it fit well as as a trio i think people might have the tendency to compare grand funk to a lot of other bands but you guys had your own sound did you have was there any other bands that you modeled yourself after were influenced by no it was I enjoyed, you know, other bands, and uh, we were all influenced by the Beatles and uh, Stones and uh, especially the Yardbirds with Jeff Beck in there. Train kept a rolling. Yeah, uh, that, that was like one that, uh, that we would play, and 
uh, I learned the lead on it, and, uh, you know, it was something that spiked us and spurred us on. And uh, when we heard the the animals uh, inside looking out, it was like, oh, man, I could hear that a different way. And they're, they're going, well, how are you hearing it? And I just started saying, I'm sitting here lonely like a, you know, and hitting the chords. And they were going, yeah, man, all right, let's do it that way. And and that way was good for everybody. <laughs> and, and I kind of turned it into a song that would embrace smoking pot, <laughs> you know. Right. And uh, especially at some of the pop festivals, I would dedicate it to all the people smoking marijuana. And they would go, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the songwriting came, you know, just as easy as the guitar playing and the singing came. So very quickly after that first, well, it's, well, it's second gig and the first gig at um, the Atlanta Pop Festival, is that when you got signed or was it the year after that you got signed to Capitol? Well, it was the same year. Okay. So you must have made an impression based on that one gig. Yes, uh, because, of course, there were representatives from the record companies accompanying the various bands that were at the gig. And uh, our manager, Terry Knight, took advantage of that, and, uh, and he signed a production deal with Capitol Records and signed the band to his... Uh, Good Night Productions, which was his company. And he told us that we were making more than the Beatles. And we believed him. I mean, you know, we were 20 years old. We believed everything he said. We took it hook, line, and sinker. We didn't have any representation uh, that represented us and filtered all the jargon coming from that camp, that managerical camp. So we just bought into it. And we didn't know we were getting screwed. (laughs) <laughs> you but know, but you I mean, were in a band with Terry, right? Like yeah, yeah. Terry was the the lead singer of Terry Knight in the Pack, and he, he was before that he was a DJ on uh, CKLW and WTAC in in Flint, Michigan, but CKLW in Windsor, Ontario, and uh, and he had these songs, and he wanted to be a singer, and he'd get up in front of the band and. We'd be doing the background vocals, and I'd look over at Brewer, and Brewer's making like this face, like, ugh, <laughs> like when Terry, <laughs> Terry singing, you know. And finally, I said one night, I said to Don, I said, why the hell are we letting this guy sing like that who can't sing very good, but he's the lead singer in this band? Why is that? <laughs> you know? And uh, he says, you know, we need to just fire him and and uh, do the pack, you know, without Terry Knight. And we did that for a while. I just and, wonder. And, sorry, I just wonder yeah. how, you know, you were obviously in a band together. There's obviously some sort of a a family unit as a band. Maybe I'm wrong, but that he would now then become your manager and then rip you off. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. that kind of surprises me. Yeah. Well. Because uh, he had done some things that just uh, made me very leery of him. Uh, And when Don suggested that we have him for a manager, I said, are you kidding me? (laughs) He's going to screw us, man. He is going to rake us over the coals. And Don says, well, at least we'd get out of Flint, Michigan. And and I kid you not, Mako, that was it. And those words came back to haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> but you did get out. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious. Um, the band released an album, and and it released like six albums in the first three years. Like you guys were just going crazy. And I guess that's maybe the the sign of the times or whatever. But very quickly, you were selling millions of albums, but without much. Um, radio or media support? Was that just based on pure live experience? Yes. Yeah, and having, you know, 185,000 people 
in Atlanta uh, that were, you know, not all were from Atlanta. They were from all over the country that, that came to this festival. So the word went out and and via more festivals like uh, Texas International uh, Pop Festival in Louisville, Texas, and, and uh, Strawberry Fields up in Montreal, and, you know, several festivals that we did, big, big, large attendance festivals got us playing, you know, a lot of big places. We were selling out uh, coliseums in, in uh, various cities and, and going to L.A. and, and uh, playing the Forum, you know, where they played hockey, ice hockey there. We'd sell the Forum out and they would sell show after show after show because the people just loved us. They loved our energy and they loved what the music had to say. You know, I was 20 years old when I started. Actually, I was 18 when I wrote my first song. But 20 when the band started and all of the music were, was some of it, you know, a lot of it was questioning uh, the state of our being uh, as far as a nation, as far as a, a world, as far as the people. And, uh, and I, people could relate to where I was coming from with my music. Did it, did it bother you that you weren't getting much radio support or that the critics were not loving the band? Did it bother you at all because you were still selling and obviously the fans loved you guys? Actually, Marco, it, it was like we would read a review and go, I wonder what the hell, where was that guy? He wasn't at our show. <laughs> Because if somebody would give an honest review of the show, they would have mentioned that the fans were just eating it up and loving the band instead of bashing us for being so loud and making fun of the way we played. I mean, I'd only been playing guitar just a few years, and I went from playing bass in Terry Knight in the Pack to playing guitar you know, in Grand Funk. So, uh, and then when, and the band in between in the pack, when we were just the pack, I was just a stand up lead singer. We had a guitar player uh, from London, Ontario, Kenny Rich, who played guitar for us and, uh, and Rod Lester played bass and, uh, and Bobby Caldwell. Oh no, it it was, it wasn't Bobby back then. It was Craig Frost playing keyboards. Hmm. So, you know, uh, it was kind of just beginning the guitar, and people said they could hear how I progressed as the records progressed. You know, and by the time we got to E Pluribus Funk, they say you were ripping the shit out of that thing. <laughs> um, you were talking about being a loud band. I mean, I think of the Grand Funk Live album as one of the heavier albums. Like really yeah. loud, loud, and I, I really loved it. I just thought it was the awesome. most amazing thing. Um, but over the years, it kind of mellowed out a bit. Was that, you know, from the live album to Locomotion, there's quite a distance between the two. Was that a oh, choice yeah. that you guys made? Is that a choice that a record company made? How does one go from, you know, Heartbreaker to Locomotion? Well. A lot of it, I believe, occurred when we went to four piece because uh, three piece, it was always, you know, the energy was a three piece band. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of air um, when you're listening to three piece. And that is part of the beauty and part of why I like listening to three piece bands is there's not this this blanket of sound. It's just there's some air in there, and you can hear the songs breathing, moving better, just, uh, you know, conceptually. And I think that adding the keyboard player, because I was outvoted, you know, on that decision. It was two to one, and uh, and we got Craig Frost back in the band. But I think the motivation for Don Brewer was to get Craig Frost in a band where he could write some music 
with Craig because I wasn't given Don enough music for him to write the lyrics to. He doesn't play um, a musical instrument that makes chords. He just plays the drums. And he took the credit for writing American Band because after we recorded it, he says to me, Mark, I've never had 100% right credit on any songs. You think I could take it on this song? I just went, yeah, man, go ahead. I didn't know uh, what he had in in his mind because I'm just that way. I'm kind of, you know, I'm a nice guy, and I'm not going to stop being a nice guy because people have screwed me over. I'm just going to have the memory of that screwing <laughs> and, tr- and hope it, you know, prevents me from entering into another situation where it can uh, occur again. <laughs> but that was a huge song for the band. Oh, yeah. And I, I wrote the drum part, the intro. I insisted on a cowbell. Don didn't own a cowbell. And I said, no, man, it has to have a cowbell. I insisted on it. And I said, listen to to all the songs, the hit songs that got cowbells on them. I'm hearing a cowbell on this has to have one. He says, okay, I'll stop and get one on the way to rehearsal tomorrow. I said, no, get six of them. (laughs) And, And I said, we'll pick the one that fits the song the best, that's in tune with our instruments in the in the key of D. So he picked six cowbells up and we picked the one that went kank, kank, kank. So that, that was part of my influence and all the chord changes, you know, and the, the way the harmonies went down. Um, I had a lot to do with that song, with writing that song. And that is exactly why Don Brewer came to me and asked me if he could have a hundred percent right credit. He was asking me to give up my 50%, which I did. And I don't regret it because I did it from my heart. And when my heart makes a decision, I I will never regret it. Because, uh, I mean, you know, you got to trust yourself. And you can't hold shit against people because that will eat your lunch, man. I'm telling you. Uh, that's how hate develops, and I don't ever want to get to the point of hating anything or anybody. Uh, that would take me off my path, buddy. But that album did very well working with Todd Rundgren, and and it kind of turned the band into to a different direction. Yes, absolutely. And Todd was a big influence on that, I believe, because the way he made us sound was more like what we sounded live, where Terry Knight didn't have that ability. He uh, he didn't have those ears. He didn't have producer's ears. But what he did have was the concept of the bass being so freaking loud <laughs> and and just eating up the speakers. He, that he had down. And... Because of that, a lot of bass players today have adopted that same type of tone, uh, tonality, uh, because it's so much more uh, characteristic, you know, of the of that guitar, the whole thing, what it can do, and uh, you know, even in my Mark Farner's American Band, my solo band, uh, I have the bass player. It, it cop the sound exactly the way Mel played it and the way the sound of the guitar was uh, t- so that I can re- reproduce that song live in front of a live audience. That's, that's my goal. Give them the record the way they heard it. The other thing, if I'm not mistaken, that Terry might have brought was the orchestral sound. Well, yeah, he he was... When I told him that Tommy Baker from the Upbeat Show uh, wanted to write some music, he said he was hearing, I was playing the chords for, I think it was for David Spiro. And David Spiro was the the owner of the uh, television station, his son. And uh, Herman Spiro owned the station. David Spiro, 
I was playing the song to him. Da, 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 and, and Tommy Baker, who was the band leader of the, the Upbeat show, he was hearing it. He came over. He says, what the hell is that? I said, it's a new song I, I, I've wrote. You know, it's called I'm Your Captain. It's closer to home. And he says, man, I am hearing things. He says, when you get to the end of that song, he says, you got to let that thing go and let it go and let it go. Let me, let me develop some stuff. He says, because I'm hearing things, I'm hearing strings, I'm, I'm hearing oboes and I'm hearing horns and things. And, and, uh, and so Terry, knowing that Tommy was a very uh, competent and confident musician was you couldn't wait to get him in there with the the strings from the the Cleveland Symphony and all the horns and everybody that Tommy knew and had the connections for uh but yeah Terry was a big part of it because he loved it he loved the idea of real strings and and real instruments this is long time before there were any synthesizers I, I don't know about how well that song did when you init initially released it as a single, and I presume as a single it would have been much shorter and maybe didn't have much of the orchestra, but now it's it's a rock classic. Yes, and I I believe because FM was in its infant stages and there were no commercials on FM when it first started, and the DJs would be stoned out of their mind <laughs> playing all this music. And when they would get to I'm Your Captain closer to home, they could go have a smoke, take a leak, uh, fix a coffee, <laughs> get, a, get all their stuff done and come back. And they loved it. You know, because they could go do that during that song. That song was like nine minutes and something, you know. And in that, being played that many times, people looked forward to hearing the strings and, and the orchestral parts. And we tried to recreate that as much as possible on the synthesizers in a live situation. But really, when we did the Bosnia uh, concert and had the strings... Uh, that was like a dream come true. And Paul Schaefer was the band leader for that, and he was loving it, uh, you know, from the David Letterman show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had parts that he w wanted to play that were not on the record, but like on, uh, on Bad Time, To Be In Love, he says, I'm hearing this. Would you mind if I did this with the orchestra? I said, no, they're they're here. Let's do it, and, let, and let's do that. And even on uh, Mean Mistreater, he introduced some strings and things, and gave it a little more depth and texture, and uh, a little more to chew on. So uh, the the orchestra, you know, the live instruments influenced not only that song and Loneliness, which was the other song that that our, our friend Tommy Baker wrote the instruments for, uh, but on into the, the future of, you know, like when Paul Schaefer, because of that, the nature of what they bring to a rock song and, and to a rock concert, yeah, they'll never die. I mean, real uh, acoustic analog instruments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, does, what does that song mean to you today? I'm your captain. It's a, it's a song that uh, I prayed for. And so I thank God for answering my prayer and bringing me those words in the middle of the night. But it's a song that when I prayed, I said, God, would you please give me a song that would reach and touch the hearts of those you want to get to? And I believe that that is what that song has done. It's, it's gotten into people's hearts. And there was no video to go with that song, Mako. 
So it is the video that our imagination runs. Mm -hmm. You know, each one of us has a personal, our own uh, different definition of what that song means. And uh, I have a DJ friend in New York City that told me that they polled an audience of 100 people and asked them to write out uh, what the meaning of the song Bridge Over Troubled Water by Simon and Garfunkel was. He told me, Farner, he says, we got 100 diversely different definitions, not any two were even similar. And I love that because... Uh, I know that the song, when I sang it and when it went out and when I wrote it, I felt like I was halfway between heaven and earth. And it's it feels that way when people witness to me what that song has meant to them, especially our troops, uh, the Vietnamese veterans, I mean, you know, Vietnam veterans, mm-hmm. uh, they had a, a special attachment to that song because it helped them come home. I can't tell you how many hundreds of veterans have come to me and told me, man, that song, I hung on to that song, uh, making it my song closer to home. I'm getting closer to my home, man. All I wanted to do was come home, dude. You don't even know. So, uh, that's what it means to me. It's, it's a commemorative, uh, spiritual, uh, song that touches the soul of those people that the creator wanted to get to. I, I wonder, because you've written a lot of great, great songs and things that are part of my, the soundtrack of my life. They might have not been hits, but I, I wonder if there are songs that you thought were amazing that really didn't get the, the notice or the coverage that you might have hoped that those songs that are still really strong with you today. Are there songs like that from the old days? Well, I really can't think of any, but I know the feeling of, uh, you know, thinking, man, this is going to be a, this is it. It's really uh, coming from a good spot. It's going to touch people just right, but it, it didn't come off that way, you know. Be- because it wasn't promoted right or because it wasn't recorded right or well, it didn't get airplay hmm. you know and and that's a big deal i mean airplay was you know everything uh for most bands it wasn't so much for us when we first started but it sure was as we progressed if we didn't get the airplay we wouldn't have had so many hits and so many fans and 1975, I got a BMI award for Bad Time to Be in Love uh, for being played more than any other song that year. So uh, even though I didn't, you know, hear it as that kind of a smash hit, I just, I felt like it was going to get to some people because it was coming from my heart. You know, it was just, it was really where I was at in life. What surprised me was, Good singing, good playing. I think that's the order. That's one of my favorite Grand Funk albums. Is it good playing, good singing? <laughs> no, it's good singing, good playing. You got it. Okay, so that was produced by Frank Zappa. I don't know how you feel about that album, but I just thought that was such an amazing album. I don't know if it got much airplay, but it's it's an album I can still listen to today and think, these are great songs and there's some great playing on there. Well, thank you for that, Mako, and and I second your emotion because I think Zappa did a wonderful job. He made that song breathe. He made the, every song breathe on that album, and you know, uh, working with him, he just it was so easy for him to do anything and to create things. And he when he compressed it and made this the song swell and you know, Crossfire, mm-hmm. you know, that was, that was one that when I went into the control room and I'm standing behind Frank and I'm listening to it come back, I looked down at his head and I said, you're a freaking genius, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> 
But the fact that it didn't, I, I mean, it must be discouraging to have release an album, and I, I think of it as a great album, and to see no traction by radio. And back then, I think that meant a lot. Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. But it may appeal to people uh, yet to be born. True. <laughs> and not long after that, the band disbanded. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that or if we don't want to talk about it. So how I'm does, answering questions. <laughs> how does that happen? Um, is it just, just years of work and you're just kind of tired and things just burn out? Well, let me explain how that happened in real time here. We, I say we, uh, Mel and Craig Frost, myself, and uh, Mark Stebbitz, uh, engineer, were all at the rehearsal studio, which we lovingly called The Swamp. And we were waiting for Don. And Don was the type of guy who was never late for anything. He was always five minutes ahead, you know. And so this day, I'm thinking, man, he... I wonder if we should call the sheriff's office and see if there's been a car wreck or something. Man, I hate to think of him, you know, but but this is not like Brewer to be late. So about an hour and a half after, you know, we were supposed to have started, we hear a car drive in. Don gets out, walks into the control room. He says, I have to find something more uh suitable for me to do in this life uh i'm calling it i said what he said yeah I, i'm over it the the i'm over this band and turned around and walked out and that was like holy shit man you know we looked at each other and going that didn't just happen. Yeah, it did. Uh, and uh, and that was it. So I formed my own band, my a solo band, and I went out and did my music. I did some solo albums. One up there at Nimbus 9 in Toronto mm -hmm. with Dick Wagner. And, uh, you know, in 19, I think it was 1981, Mel Shocker calls me and said, hey, let's put, put the band back together. I said, well, see if Don's into it. And so evidently he was because uh, there was a rehearsal set up in northern Michigan in a, a great big lodge that uh, a friend of Melvin's uh, owned, and he was going to loan it to us to just see if we could play music together again. And on the way into the first rehearsal, I recall Brewer saying, well, we could probably do this and probably have, you know, something together in, you know, three to six months. And we go in, we practice. On his way out the door, Don says, holy shit, we're ready right now. <laughs> <laughs> What was it like to be to to follow your solo career? I know you had some success, and I think you had some success in the Christian rock music genre. Yeah, God rock. Yeah, we you know we lovingly call it God rock because there's so many different uh, definitions of Christians. I mean, people who call them self Christians act very differently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, you know. Yes. Uh, so uh, it's God rock, and. Uh, yeah, I had some success and and had some fun and had some really uh, embracing life moments with people, uh, being able to talk to them through songs and talk to them uh, about songs that I had written uh, that touched their heart in a way uh, that left room for me to be a witness for love. And, uh, and that really, uh, that those years that I had spent in the, 
the so-called Christian uh, music scene, you know, getting played on Christian radio. Um, that was a weird trip because I, I didn't, I'm not made to entertain people in a church, people who are already uh, saved in their minds. Um, and it just felt weird. It, you know, I, did, I, I felt like, man, I'm not with my people here. Because I also found there was a lot of hypocrisy uh, in those places. And I, I finally came to the conclusion after a friend of mine told me, Mark, you got to get a 501c3 tax exemption, man, so you can give people, a, uh, you know, when they give to your ministry, uh, you can give them a tax-free, you know, incentive. And I'm thinking, tax-free, what the hell is, what, you know? And so this attorney says, well, come on over to my office and I'll, I'll uh, show you what it's about, but you really need to have one. So I go to his office. He goes over the 501c3. I said, dude, I am not going to get one of those. I wouldn't sign that damn thing for nobody, for love nor money. That is, he's, because what are you talking about? And I said, because from what you just read to me from that 501c3, I would be turning my ministry over to men. And I don't want men, especially those who own the Federal Reserve, have to have anything to do with how my music is touching people, how my ministry, and my ministry is to, you know, I go, uh, I have gone to uh, drug rehabs, to juvenile detention centers, to prison camps, to maximum security prison houses, county jails, and all over because I'm a musician that somebody, I'm, I'm recognizable. I can walk in, I've got credentials, and I can share love. And I don't ever pass the plate. But this attorney says, but you're going to miss out on tax exemption. I said, it ain't about tax exemption. Love don't need tax exemption, man. You know, I said, I'm thanks, but no thank you. I said, I wouldn't sign one of those for love nor money. And he goes, well, you caused me to question my own 501c3 because he had a ministry, him and his wife had a ministry for uh, couples that were on on the outs with each other. And so anyways, uh, because of that peculiar obstacle in the church, <laughs> uh, I had, I just stopped playing to, to the church crowd, even though the church crowd would buy my CDs and uh, tapes when I first started the cassette tapes. And I appreciated that. I saw how, uh, from, like I said before, these people call themselves Christians. I went over and I, I ministered in a Mormon church. I ministered in a Baptist church. I ministered in a Catholic church. I, but I get more satisfaction from singing to a maximum security crowd of 500 inmates because they are listening to me. They appreciate that someone would come to them. And I don't ever give an altar call because I don't believe in altar calls. You know, it's like uh, some guy standing up there, okay, everybody that wants to get saved, come on up. It's like, no, that ain't how it happens. It's very personal, the commitment you make to love. And uh, at this one in Kinross, Michigan, at this one jail up there where there was 500 inmates, uh, the chaplain of the prison said, you know, the first time you mention Jesus Christ, uh, half of these inmates will get up and walk out. So so just prepare yourself. And I said, okay. So we get out there. I plug in my amplifier, and I'm ripping it up. I'm singing. We're rocking. And I, I did mention Jesus Christ about a million times, and nobody got up and left. 
But I, instead of an altar call, all I did, Brother Mako, I said, if, if what I'm feeling in my gut right now, if you, any of you guys are feeling this, I said, I want you to know what that is. That, that is the Holy Spirit. I feel the presence of love in this room so much, so thorough uh, throughout this room. I said, uh, now you're in here away from the ones that you love. And you got nieces and nephews. You got sons and daughters. You got grandkids. You know, they need you to be an example to them. And I just want to know that uh, when I leave this place tonight, if the music that I've played and if our presentation to you has meant something to you along these lines, and if I'm right about that feeling in your gut right now, and you are going to commit to being a better man, you are going to not come back to this place, would you please stand up with me right now? 500 inmates stood to their feet, brother. Hmm. And that is worth more to me than people saying, you know religious things <laughs> did, did uh, going through that journey through god rock did that affect you any in any way positive it's like negatively just against uh people that have signed a 501c3 any it is my humble opinion brother that any religious uh institution any church any ministry, any evangelist, anybody that is promoting uh, the love of Jesus Christ who signs a 501c3 and operates under a 501c3 is operating out of the, of the Creator's will. And it's removing itself from the blessing of God. Now, you might have the blessing of money and people coming and giving to your ministry, but believe me, that is not profitable in heaven. Good deeds, good deeds, small good deeds that you mean from your heart, that's that's what means something in heaven. And so the negative part is, I believe, uh, you know, the churches in my country— most of them operate under a 501c3, and therefore it's negative to me what they're doing. Uh, they've given the authority to men. They couldn't, they couldn't do the will of love because they're after the money. But, but I wondered, did, you, did it affect your audience base other than the Christian rock audience base? Like, as you decided to do, go back and play more grand funk tunes or whatever. Did you lose any of those audiences because of you, of this, or did you gain more? Well, I because of what I did was I took my music into bars and nightclubs and you know, uh, big places, uh, little places. It didn't matter. I always, without fail, there would be a line to the bus. You know, well, we played up in Golden, Colorado, um, at the Buffalo Rose, which is a large, huge saloon with, uh, you know, live. Uh, well, they got like shoulder mount uh, buffalo and elk and deer and antelope hanging every place up there, uh, and the people just loved the music. They they came out. They stood in line till daylight, brother. And I mean, the line went around the block and they got on the bus. We talked to them, signed autographs and stuff. And people wanted to pray with us. They just said, will you pray with me? Will you pray for me? Yeah. Yeah, man. Sure. So uh, it's, that is rewarding to me that somebody would come and trust you uh, that much with, uh, with that and give you that uh, feeling of confidence that uh you know that you what you would say to them or say for them would make a difference in their life man did you ever lose that confidence of 
of what I say meaning something? You yeah, mean? or just of yourself, of your music. No, not really. I've uh, I've always had that confidence, and uh, even though you know I'm seven, I'll be seventy four this year. Uh, if I make it to September 29th, <laughs> but, uh, I, at this age, I still, uh, love to entertain and, uh, there's no regret because I think regret is part of debt consciousness and we have to really uh, release ourselves from debt consciousness. Um, you know, it's uh, like uh, like Bob Marley said, uh, you know, emancipate yourself. Uh, we have to set ourselves free because no one else is going to. But once we once we start that journey, it's a never ending journey that that the rewards keep coming from, and you're just going to keep getting those rewards until you walk right out of your bone suit. <laughs> Mark, I want to, I want to thank you for doing this. It's, as I said, it's a thrill for me to talk to you as a, as a kid growing up in the seventies. Um, I had the chance to see you at varsity stadium one year. Um, I think it was the shining on tour, but your records still resonate. They, they still get played a lot in my house and it's it's absolutely a thrill to to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Marco. I appreciate it, brother, and uh, I appreciate uh, the encouragement that I've received today from you, brother. All right. Um, one final question. Tell me, tell me about this journey. How do you summarize this amazing jour- musical journey you've taken? Uh, I summarize it with uh, the the love that has been established, the love that has been expressed through the music, uh, the gift that I give willingly, is, you know, because you give gifts with no strings attached. And I learned how to give when I was a young four-year-old boy. I learned how to give. And that lesson has stayed with me all these years so when I give, there's no strings attached to what I give. And I give my music willingly. I give the love that's in there because it comes to me internally, just like every other songwriter, brother. Uh, it comes from inside. You know, there it's there. Those juices are there. And it's like you're, there's this river going by with all these apples in it. And you're bobbing for songs. You know? <laughs> I should say that there's a song on your website, Never and Always. It's a it's a wonderful song. It's a wonderful video, so people should check it out. Thank you for that. I appreciate that so much. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this, and uh, I hope to see you one of these days. Yeah, me too. All right. But, but if I don't, if I don't see you in the future, I'll see you in the past year for sure. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, Brother Michael.